Now let's look at the effect of certain pathological conditions on the heart. Let's first look at a systolic heart failure. This is congestive heart failure. The heart cannot generate the same amount of force. During systolic failure, the heart is unable to push blood over to the arterial side, leading to a high venous pressure. Blood is beginning to pile up on the venous side, causing an increase in stretch of the heart. Now, because of the Frank-Starling relationship, moving from this point over to this point here causes an increase in contractility, leading to a nearly identical stroke volume, 75, it was 79, and arterial pressure. It's 116 over 79, it was about 120 over 80. This can't continue, however. This will continue to move to the right, and we'll notice a massive reduction in arterial pressure as heart failure proceeds. If we look down here, we can see again increase in end diastolic volume, increase in end systolic volume. Little change in actual arterial blood pressure. Notice also that the atrial pressure has risen. The breadcrumbs show it should have been down here because of the increase in venous volume. Let's look at a diastolic heart failure. This is the result of increase in fibrous material, a fibrotic heart, so that the heart has a hard time stretching. It's losing its compliance. Elasticity is increasing. Now we can see that the heart cannot fill. As a result, we see a smaller stroke volume once again. But look at what's happening here to the pressure volume loop, and we can see that down here. Atrial pressure is beginning to rise quite a bit. This is the result, again, of a buildup of blood volume on the venous side uh, rather than the arterial side. Arterial blood volume is actually falling. We can see that with the blood pressure change coming down a little bit here. So this heart is having a harder and harder time filling. As a result, it's going to have an increasingly difficult time emptying because the Frank-Starling relationship is also inhibiting the contractility of the heart. Now let's look at some valve defects that could occur. In this case, we've got mitral stenosis. Now the mitral valve is failing to open properly, so blood is not leaving the atrium, and therefore we can see a large rise in atrial pressure here and a fall in ventricular pressure. The blood is piling up in the atrium, not getting into the ventricle as it's relaxing. So we see a big difference between atrial and ventricular diastolic pressure. We see a decrease in end diastolic volume, resulting from poor blood flow from the atrium into the ventricles. Also, the ventricles now are having a hard time ejecting the blood because the Frank-Starling relationship is reducing contractility. As a result, our arterial blood volume is falling and our venous blood volume is rising. Arterial blood pressure is falling. We see that down here. The yellow solid line as opposed to the dotted line here, which was the normal line. So volume and pressure on the arterial side is falling. Volume and pressure on the venous side is rising. Mitral stenosis. Let's look at a mitral regurgitation. Mitral valve is failing. So in this case, when the ventricles contract, and they begin contracting at this point over here, Blood is leaving the ventricle and entering the atrium because the valve is failing, the mitral valve is failing. We can see it down here. We're now showing a rise in pressure in the atrium. And once again, both atrial pressure and ventricular diastolic pressure are higher than normal. Now, as the ventricles continue contracting, the first thing that's happening is blood is moving into the atrium. And then suddenly, the pressure rises high enough to open the aortic valve and now we see ejection out into the aorta. And again, isovolumetric relaxation and filling. We can see here, it's hard to see underneath that writing here, the drop in ventricular volume during what is normally the isovolumetric contraction period, but it's not isovolumetric at this point. Now, let's look at aortic failures. Here we see an aortic stenotic valve, and notice that the vent peak ventricular pressure is much, much higher than aortic pressure. Normally, the peak ventricular pressure will come into equilibrium with the aortic pressure as blood is moving out of the heart into the aorta. But in this case, the pressure that is rising in the ventricles is failing to open the aortic valve. As a result, the aortic valve opens much, much later. In this case, up around 120 plus millimeters of mercury, we finally get the aortic valve to open. The pressure rises and rises continually until finally it begins to fall and we see a reduction in stroke volume. Now isovolumetric relaxation and filling again. 
So if we look down here, we can see a reduction in blood pressure, the solid line as opposed to normal, but a much, much greater increase in peak ventricular pressure. The blood just isn't leaving the ventricles. This is leading once again to a low blood volume and low blood pressure on the arterial side and a high blood volume and blood pressure on the venous side. And we can see that with an increase in atrial pressure. And finally, let's look at an aortic regurgitation. In this example, the aortic valve is failing. So during ventricular relaxation, diastole, we see blood moving from the aorta back into the ventricles. No isovolumetric relaxation. Now the relaxation is sucking blood back in from the aorta. And we begin to fill. And now we see a very small increase in left ventricular isovolumetric contraction. And in this example, we see our blood pressure is somewhere around 136 over 52. 136 here, 52 here. So why the low diastolic pressure? The blood that is normally in the aorta during diastole is moving back into the heart, bringing arterial diastolic pressure down very low. I've seen arterial diastolic pressures fall well below 40 millimeters of mercury and rise well above 150 millimeters of mercury on the systolic side. So this is an aortic valve failure. We can see the same thing happening here. And here's the non-isovolumetric relaxation in the green line coming up here. So we're seeing an increase in arterial pressure. The primary reason for the increase in arterial pressure in this example is a large increase in the Frank-Starling relationship, increase in ejection of blood. And in this individual, uh, over the long term, there's going to be an increase in the blood volume regulated by kidneys. One last thing, in the lower right corner here, we can see cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. In this case, cardiac output is almost 5 liters per minute. Heart rate is 63 beats per minute. Stroke volume is 79 milliliters, or 0 0.079 liters. If I increase the heart rate, we can see a decrease in end diastolic volume. The heart it does not have as much time to fill, so end diastolic volume is going to go down. Cardiac output is now 5.9 liters per minute. Stroke volume has fallen to 66 milliliters, and heart rate has risen to 90. Decreasing heart rate, we see the opposite effect, increased filling time, increased stroke volume uh, due to the Frank-Starling relationship, a decreased cardiac output primarily because of the decrease in heart rate. Now we're going to superimpose the pressure volume loop on top of the systolic pressure curve, the Frank-Starling relationship, and the diastolic pressure curve, the relationship between passive stretch and elastance. If we now decrease the systolic pressure curve as a function of heart failure, the systolic pressures come down. The increase in preload has moved us over here to the right. The increase in the Starling effect causes any greater ejection than we might expect with heart failure, bringing us back up to a fairly normal stroke volume and blood pressure. If, on the other hand, we superimpose this onto a diastolic malfunction, the diastolic heart failure increased elastance, decreased compliance of the heart, causes us to shift to the left. The decrease in end diastolic volume leads to a decrease in contractility and therefore a decrease in arterial pressure. If we now look at, again, the heart failure case, here we just saw a decrease in the systolic pressure curve associated with congestive heart failure, but we see a fairly normal stroke volume and a fairly normal blood pressure. If this continues, however, now we see a rising up on the diastolic curve and coming down on the systolic curve. This individual is no longer able to keep up the arterial blood pressure and stroke volume. If this continues further, this individual will be in dire shape.